Unit 10, Lipid Metabolism. So this is a huge unit, the biggest one that we're going to do, so I suggest breaking it down into the following pieces here. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but you can look at it. Digestion should be a review. A couple of these are really short topics, like the carnitine shuttle. only take a second to memorize. And there's a whole lot of information in this unit that he doesn't test over, you don't need, it's just extra information. So I'm going to, again, like always, stick to what's going to be tested over. The first part is the digestion. So when you eat fat, these are the things you're eating. You're eating triacylglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol esters. To break them down, you're going to add water to all of them, plus these enzymes. And then these are your products. Fatty acids being, you know, the product all the time. Cholesterol is a product. Monoacylglycerides is a product of dietary dietary fat <clears throat> meaning that these are the dietary fat enzymes so he could ask what the products are and if you see like a diacylglyceride or a triacylglyceride those are not products of dietary fat as far as what we break down So we break them down and we take these fatty acids and we're going to activate them. So here's our fatty acid here. You're going to add a CoA. So I'll probably say this a lot during this video, but every time you see the CoA, just think uh, pantothenate, B5. So I'm going to have it abbreviated. So this is fatty acyl synthetase. He just calls it synthetase a lot. Uh, it's a ligase, enzyme class 6. It has this ATP here. So activation requires 2 ATP. Just trust me on that one. To get the ATP, you have to regenerate it once, so you're actually using 2 ATP, even though it looks like you're only investing 1. So per activation, is going to cost 2 ATP, and that'll come in later when we do some ATP calculations. So now that you have the activated fat fatty acids, you're going to reassemble them into lipoproteins. Chylomicrons are the type that you're going to reassemble them into in your blood and then take it to the liver. And the components of the chylomicrons are triacylglycerides, cholesterol esters, and cholesterol which you can combine that amount to make the total cholesterol. Phospholipids and the P stands for protein. So the first big chart the question's over is called plasma lipoproteins. The breakdown of that chart, uh, know that the chylomicrons are the largest and the HDLs are the smallest. And then, like everything, know the highest and the lowest. That's what he's going to ask over. So the, the one of the most tags is chylomicrons, 86%. It also has the lowest amount of proteins, only 2% protein. VLDLs are mostly triacylglycerides, about 52% or something. Um, so if you're asked what the highest component of that is, of VLDLs, it's the tags as well. In the intermediate, the amount of tags equals the total cholesterol. LDLs have the most cholesterol and HDLs have the highest amount of protein. There's a slide in there that's just called like lipoproteins. Just, there's no trick to it, just memorize the whole chart. It talks about each of these individually, where they're assembled, and what they are. So a few questions will come, may come from that chart.
Alright, lipolysis or mobilization of your triacylglycerides. Starts with PKA. The whole course can be pretty much summarized between PKA's actions and PP1's actions. So the way it starts is PKA phosphorylates uh, perilipin, if I'm pronouncing that right. And that is going to open the door to this whole cascade. So PKA starts it off, phosphorylates, and then you have a co-activator from perilipin, which activates to ATGL. And that is going to take your stored fat here, your triacylglyceride, and take off one fatty acid. Now it's a diacylglyceride. The next enzyme is hormone-sensitive lipase hormone sensitive because it also gets help from PKA. PKA phosphorylates it to activate it, so you release another fatty acid here. The monoacylglyceride gets converted into a free fatty acid by mag lipase. And then that fatty acid is going to be activated and oxidized. So all of these enzymes here are not dietary fat enzymes. The, the first one I showed you, the first chart, those are your dietary fat. These are for mobilization. You've reassembled it and stored it. So this is stored fat in your body that you're now breaking down, not fat that you've eaten. That's a big distinction that comes up a lot. We're going to talk about the activation and the oxidation. The activation is the same as uh, we showed you before for the reassembly. It's with the synthetase. Keep, keep the synthetase and the synthase separated. Fat, fatty acid synthase is the huge enzyme that we talk about during synthesis. Synthetase is the activating enzyme for fatty acids. So carnitine shuttle is very simple. Uh, carnitine, is a specialized fatty acid, just brings in, it can transport uh, between the cytosol, cytosol side here and the mitochondria side here. So the only thing to clarify is you have the acyl-CoA, is what he calls it in the diagram, which is just your activated fatty acid. So it drops the CoA, sneaks in the acyl with the carnitine, the carnitine picks up another CoA once it's in the mitochondria. So the acyl and the CoA go off, back to where we started, and then the carnitine can leave and do it over again. Very simple shuttle. CoA involved, so you have B5 involved as well. Beta oxidation. I think he used to, in really old tests, you had to memorize the enzymes for this, but he hasn't anymore, which is a very good thing. And the steps of beta oxidation, just remember, is O hot. The O's are oxidation, H is hydration, and theolysis, which is a cleavage step. The first oxidation is going to result in an FADH2. The second oxidation is going to result in a NADH. So after you've taken the fatty acid, you've taken it through these steps, it's going to be two carbons shorter. You're going to have these products over here. And you're going to have an acetyl-CoA. So the three products per round FADH2, NADH, and acetyl-CoA. And this is going to, two carbon shorter is going to keep repeating until there's nothing left. So let's look at how much ATP that will generate. The simple formula, the number of carbons minus two divided by two to get the amount of rounds. So there's a whole example in the book, uh, or in the slides, that I won't go over. 
So each round generates this, which if you remember from the Krebs cycle unit, this is what they're all worth in ATP. So each round except the last one is going to generate 14 ATP. The last one you get two acetyl CoA's plus these guys again. So you're going to get 24 ATP in the last round. So if I had a number of rounds, um, I had done this, or seven rounds, six of them are going to have 14 ATP, and one of them is going to have 24 ATP. And that's the total amount of ATP per fatty acid. So a few steps to add on to if you have different or uh, unique fatty acids. If you, there's an unsaturation, it requires an isomerase and a reductase. Plus OHOT. Plus your normal, your normal steps. If you have an odd chain, remember odd chain, odd number three. It requires three different enzymes carboxylase, epimerase, and a mutase. Mutase is B12. The carboxylases are always uh, biotin dependent. They also cost an ATP. Um, this might, I don't think this will come up, but because you have an odd chain at the very end, you have a C3 CoA molecule left over rather than acetyl CoA or C2 CoA. So the propineal CoA goes into succinyl CoA, which you'll recognize as a metabolite from the Krebs cycle. I don't think this will come up, um, but if you were to see this metabolite, it's derived from <clears throat> odd chain fatty acids. I forgot to show something on the last page, but the whole beta oxidation, because you have a FAD, that's riboflavin. You have a NADH, which is niacin, and CoA is involved, so it's pantothenate as well. So for the odd chain fatty acid, it requires biotin B12 plus this B2, B3, B5. And there's a little random side note about ketone bodies which are a gift from the liver to the rest of the body during times of starvation mainly. They only come in significant amounts during starvation. It's mainly going to the brain, uh, also other cells. I think he mentions like the heart and kidneys as being your other important organs next to the brain. The liver cannot use ketone bodies. It can make them, but it, won't, it can't uh, use them for energy. It's because of one enzyme, which we'll talk about on the next page. So this is just kind of some blind memorization. I wouldn't worry too much about the exact um, every single piece of the equation, but I would know the enzymes and which way they go. So you have the two acetyl CoA's into aceto acetyl CoA. That's by theolase. And some of these will be used in both. This is the um, production of ketone bodies. The next page will be using them for energy. So then you have uh, HMG-CoA, which is made by the HMG-CoA synthase. So all of these involve B5. They all have CoAs around here, um, except the last one here, after you go from HMG-CoA to acetoacetate, and acetoacetate into hydroxybutyrate, that's a dehydrogenase. So that's nice and dependent. There's an enzyme, and sometimes it spontaneously goes to acetone, but that one's not as important. Uh, the ketone bodies to recognize are acetoacetate and the hydroxybutyrate. Sometimes it's listed as D3 uh, hydroxybutyrate, sometimes it's beta hydroxybutyrate or D beta. It doesn't matter, it's all the same. If you see hydroxybutyrate, it's talking about the same metabolite. 
So during time of starvation, you have this acetyl-CoA that you've converted into these ketone bodies. A little bit during fasting, a lot more during starvation. So during starvation, your glucose is going to go down, and your uh, fatty acids in the blood are going to stay relatively the same. You're going to be using about the same amount of fatty acids, but what's going to change the most is the ketone bodies. Those increase tenfold, a hundredfold, very large amounts. There's a graph in there that will show the glucose slightly going down and fatty acids staying relatively the same. So this was all done in the liver. And now this ketone body is going to be out in the blood and taken to the cells that need it. So right where we left off with the hydroxybutyrate, we're going to start there again. So now it's entered a cell that can use ketone bodies which is any cell except the liver. Same enzyme as before, it's going to just reverse that last step we saw on the, the previous page to make it into acetoacetate again. So again, these are our ketone bodies. The enzyme we'll most likely ask about is the CoA transferase, which takes acetoacetate into acetoacetyl-CoA. That is not in the liver. That's the only reason why the liver can't use it. And then there's theolase again, so the same same enzyme, and then you have acetyl-CoAs that can go into the Krebs cycle. So most likely what you might see is either this enzyme being uh, called out for not being in the liver, or this full reaction from acetoacetate to acetoacetyl-CoA I'm saying this cannot happen in what organ or the liver can do all these reactions except which one it's this one that he's talking about. So that's probably a most important part of the ketone bodies. So fatty acid synthesis makes it a lot more complicated and it kind of goes out of order uh, in the slides for how it actually happens which was confusing to me at first. Uh, but to re remind you what's going to happen is, <clears throat> alright, the story is you've eaten too much sugar, essentially, and you have acetyl-CoA, too much of it in your mitochondria. So you're going to take it into the cytosol via the citrate shuttle. Then you have the ACC reaction, which we'll talk about, and fatty acid synthase puts it all together. It's the largest enzyme, it has the most enzymatic activity, it can do um, the most that we've seen so far in all of biochem too. So starting with the citrate shuttle to make the f to make the fat we need to do it in the cytosol but we have the ingredients in the mitochondria so you're going to take the acetyl-CoA mix it with oxaloacetate via citrate synthase or Krebs cycle enzyme. Citrate is going to go through its carrier and porin from the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. Then you have the citrate lyase, which is another one of his favorites to ask about because it's an exception lyase. It uses, I have it written down here, um, citrate, ATP, CoA, and water rather than just its normal lyase form. That's going to give you oxaloacetate. The fourth enzyme is malate dehydrogenase, which you're going to spend an NADH on. Malic enzyme goes from malate to pyruvate, which you're going to take that um, continuation, you're going to be producing an NADPH from there. So those are his favorite things to ask about. NADPH should ring a bell from the PPP. And this is the same, um, the malate dehydrogenase as the Krebs cycle, except it's going the other way. And the Krebs cycle went from malate to oxaloacetate, and you got the NADH, but this time you're spending the NADH and getting an NAD+. Plus. And then pyruvate can get across the border here. 
the last enzyme is pyruvate carboxylase, which you recognize from gluconeogenesis. It's carboxylase, so it's biotin dependent, and it takes one ATP to get it. As far as we're concerned, uh, all of that is kind of recycling. The NADPH is going to be used <clears throat> in fatty acid synthesis, but the whole point of this is you've got a CoA from the mitochondria into the cytosol. So that's what we're going to pick up here. This is the ACC reaction. It's going to be the key regulatory step. Basically, when you're making a fatty acid, you want one acetyl CoA, and then you want about seven C3 CoAs. So, to make the C3 CoAs, you're going to take the acetyl CoA and change it into it via the ACC reaction. <clears throat> ACC stands for acetyl-CoA carboxylase. It's carboxylase, so it's biotin dependent, spending an ATP, um, and here's the extra carbon that's coming on. So you take your acetyl-CoA that we have in the cytosol now, using an ATP, attach another carbon onto it. So now you have C3-CoA and this other stuff. So now everything else in fatty acid synthesis is going to be done by fatty acid synthase. Don't worry too much about the details, just kind of focus on what's on here if you're having a hard time understanding it. So you're first going to start off the process by exchanging the CoA for ACP. So you take acetyl-CoA, add it to ACP, and a transacylase or some sort of transferase is going to turn it into acetyl-ACP. And the CoA is go away. <clears throat> Same thing happens for the C3 CoA. Add the transfer on the ACP and then you have melanyl CoA. Sorry, uh, melanyl ACP. So after you've done the loading, you're going to go through the exact opposite steps as beta oxidation. So if we look over here, these are the oxidation steps. Now we're going to turn it upside down. If you remember OHOT, T8, T-O-H-O. So the opposite of the theolysis, or the cleavage step, is the condensation. Opposite of oxidation is reduction. Opposite of dehydrogenation, or the hydration is dehydration. And opposite of oxidation, reduction again. So you can remember it's the exact opposite. You can remember it's the very catchy CRDR. Those are the steps. Um, to continue to make the fatty acid. At the end of all that, you're going to just continue loading on more melanyl CoAs until you get to the end. So you're going to go through these steps six more times. This is the net reaction, which is always good to know for making a palmitate. Here's the NADPH it was spending that was produced by the malic enzyme. Here were the extra CoAs. To see how much ATP this costs, for every acetyl CoA, which there's only one per palmitate, it costs two ATPs. Those two ATPs came from activating it that we talked about at the very beginning. The melanyl co CoAs, each of those cost three. Two to activate it, just the same as the um, acetyl-CoA, because it started out as acetyl-CoA. And then that extra one comes from the ACC reaction. There's the third ATP. And you have seven of those melanyl-CoAs entering it. So you have two total contributed by the acetyl-CoA, and 21 contributed by melanyl-CoAs, which gives you 23 ATP as the cost 
to make a palmitate. So there's a chart shortly after this section that says the uh, lipid metabolism, metabolism location. That's a good one to know. A lot of questions are going to come from that one. In addition to knowing where the desaturations and elongations take place, um, I would know that desaturations have an iron involved and elongations after you go through the um, opposite of beta oxidation or the fatty acid synthesis phase, the condensation and reduction dehydra dehydration, I keep on saying dehydrogenation, there's an extra hydrolysis step. That's the only time you see that hydrolysis step. There's a big thing about fatty acid synthase and it lists all of the different um, enzymatic activities and it gives them a two letter abbreviation. I memorized all that and I didn't need it and that's kind of up to you. I don't think that he'll ask that, it's not that important, but you never know for a quiz or something. Let's see, so we have our omega-6s and omega-3s, our essential fatty acids, we can't make those. It's the important thing to know that if you see these, they cannot be made in the liver. These are plants only. They're essential precursors for our eicosanoids. So this is my abbreviated version of about two slides that are put together. You have the phospholipids or the diacylglycerides, which can both go to our akindonate by the enzymes we've seen before, PLA2 or DG lipase. And this is the precursor for leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Lipooxygenases are the enzyme that catalyze this reaction. And COX or cyclooxygenases make the prostaglandins. NSAIDs block this, that's another popular question of his. And there's a the serine involved, is where the NSAID binds to. Uh, that might be a quiz question. It's a specific amino acid named. So know that. That should cover the slides about the eicosanoids. Alright, last page. Fatty acid regulation. It's going to happen in both phases, the degradation and the synthesis. So as far as the mobilization is concerned, Imagine that hormone-sensitive lipase is sensitive to these hormones. If you're burning fat, that's because you are fasting or exercising. Eating will slow that down. The carnitine shuttle is inhibited by a high concentration of malonyl-CoA. You get that because the ACC reaction is happening. The ACC reaction is happening because of PP1 because you have you've eaten, you have insulin. So know that you know these are the specific metabolites that can block the uh, carnitine shuttle. So we'll ask about the the specifics on that one. Fatty acid synth synthesis. You have the citrate lyase, which is activated by PP1. Uh, more specifically, high concentrations of acetyl CoA activate the citrate lyase. And then ACC is the key enzyme. Stop. You won't make fat if you're exercising or fasting. You will make it if you're eating. It's also partially activated by citrate. I'm sorry, and it's also uh, inhibited by high amounts of fatty acid. So that's the summary. This is the stuff that he most commonly asks about in regulation. It gets a little more complicated than that. Um, during the last five slides, so if you really want to uh, learn everything there is to know about fatty acid regulation, I would look at those. I wouldn't think he's uh, going to ask about it, but it wouldn't hurt to, to look over them and be familiar with it. That's all I got.